Hello and welcome to Beyond Top 10 Tennis. My name is Dr. Ashley Morgan Burge and I'm your host. I'm the author of 12 books, a CEO of 12 years, and the founder of a startup set on data privacy, most importantly, an elite performance coach of over 18 years, having worked with athletes throughout Europe, the United States to Australia. Most excitingly, I am the world's leading scientist on coach and and athlete performance specifically behind how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. My work includes everything from mitigating injuries to conditioning behaviors that set a player up long term for the long game towards a top 10 tennis ranking. I behind theories from the optimal performance theory, optimal behavior for optimal performance, the barrier breaker, the rule of transference to the goal golden rule. As has become custom, each episode we normally dive into one of my books and share additional insights and dig a little bit deeper. But today's episode is a special edition for the Australian Open that is currently underway. However, today's episode with new key insights plays its own role, like so many other episodes, in developing the player, parent to coach for that road ahead towards a top 10 tennis ranking. So as always, buckle in and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, If you've been listening uh, to us for some time now, thank you so much. If you are new, thank you all the same, but I really would encourage you to track back, especially the past week's episode that have recap days uh, one, two, three to four of the Australian Open. And I'm sure by now you are all familiar with that this is a special edition and we have been releasing them um especially for uh, the Australian Open. And I think as I've touched on um, in our previous episodes, uh, given uh, that Beyond Top 10 Tennis has only been around for roughly eight months now, uh, this is the first time we're able to be live in a manner of speaking at the same time of the Australian Open. And I'd really love to hear your feedback on this because I think uh, we will continue to do this for the main events throughout the season because so far I've been having so much fun and I really hope um, you've been having a fun along with me uh, because look day one and two recap it it was so I think intense because we had a lot of plays to get through Uh, the same for days two um, uh, the end of then three and four because we really had to cover rounds one and two and look today we're out need to finish on those round two matches to get through all of the round three matches of the Australian Open. Um, men's and women's main draw singles only we've been focusing on so I really want to underscore that and today oh my goodness marks the beginning of the round of 16 matches and this is where I think we really get down to business especially if again if you've been following the work and you are familiar with uh, my latest release that's only been out for would you believe it or not one whole month oh my goodness time has flown So how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking, which was my uh, 12th book released, um, really underscored why this round of 16 really, I think, signals 
good things to come potentially. Um, the What Is Your Game Missing series. Um, if you've been following our blog posts this week, and oh my goodness, they have been intense. I've really been trying to get them out a lot quicker. Uh, typically, you would hear from me maybe one, two times a week max. And this has been every single day under the pump. But remember, given that uh, my book has been published, it's been released, that has freed up a little bit of my, let's say, writing time to really offer you um, some really key insights that you, you can just grab on the fly which I think is really important because look, day one, we had insights on Djokovic to Prismic. Even though Prismic went down, that that was definitely one to watch. Um, Day two insights were on Pavlichenkova and Vecic. Um, That was really cool to watch. Even though Pavlichenkova came out with the win, and remember this was day two, there were some really good insights there. Uh, day three, Ribikina versus Pliskova. Super cool, very good match, irrespective, obviously, of the results we'll discuss today. If you have not uh, read them, I really would encourage you just to become familiar with uh, where we are going, um, the insights, the nitty gritty, what we've been discussing in a manner of speaking. Uh, day four insights then were on Dimineur and Arnaldi. It was really interesting to share, I think, not so much on Dimineur and Arnaldi's um, progressions, but when we're looking from whether it's a technical perspective, how you track there and progress to that stage. Stage. But primarily through those uh, four pieces, you will see that I've referred to the What Is Your Game Missing series. Also in the previous episodes, episodes too, because it's really important because what is your game missing? What is your game missing now? And what is your game missing to win? Touch on key insights of round of 16 performances and further, which means if you make a round of 16 Uh, performance and you achieve that result at a grand slam. I really need to underscore that it has to be at a grand slam because that is the pinnacle of play. We need to see how you're performing under pressure. Irrespective of the tournaments throughout the year, these are the four ones you get to peek at. And we've got episodes on peak performances, um, periodization, how to ensure those peak patterns of play um, are in, in sync in a manner of speaking with these grand slams, but also the, the problems that arise at the beginning of the season. And we'll get into that later because I'm sure between, I think, our previous episodes and what's happened um, over the last three days, and so we will touch on that why and why it's not as surprising. So over the last uh, three days, um, the the other blog pieces, you've got insights on Stevens and Kazatkina. That was really solid. Um, Then day six, we did uh, golf versus parks, irrespective of that scoreline. Really exciting things for American uh, tennis. In in well, I'll say on the women's tour, but also the men's in this respect. And irrespective, being an Aussie, we've got some really, I think, solid results, especially with Demeneur to uh, Storm uh, Hunter. Um, It was really cool. But this is this is different, and uh, there are really good projections that I um, I need to encourage, irrespective of what country you are based in or nationality, etc. Um, there's a reason why certain countries um, are pushing that mark a little further. And then day seven's roundup, we're on Zhang versus Wang. And even though uh, Zhang is uh, the 12th seed and the high ranked player with Wang just inside the top 100, I think around 94, that ranking will rise now. But I really want to encourage each and every one of you to give Wang some more attention because I tell you what, even though though Zhang walked away with the win, it, you should have seen that tie break. If you haven't, have a look back at it because especially that match point, um, 
Wang was on the cusp there and I have to say she was playing like a top 20 player and these are the markers that I look for um, and now irrespective of her ranking and if and, and again I want to encourage you to read um, these pieces and all links are always left in the bio or go directly to AMA International and look for the blogs tab or head on over to uh, Medium if you're over there um, and, and you will see the, the catalog but these pieces really underscore some key metrics that um, are discussed more explicitly in the what is your game missing series but are held back in a manner of speaking so not to get uh, too complicated um, or too uh, technical uh, in case you are not familiar with the work so I guess I've tried to cater for a wider audience um, so you can dip your toes into I think this uh, relatively new landscape um, and especially I think if you've been listening to uh, the commentators irrespective where you're based because I know um, different channels different um, commentary etc um, one of I think the important points that have come to, come to light is when you hear about data analytics so I really want to shed some further light in this respect and what's really important to touch on is that um, there is more uh, to data than meets the eye. Uh, typically, what athletes have been doing at this level, they've been using data from that analytical perspective to shape their play, so their decision making. Now, a, a lot of players um, prefer to say, problem solve on court and I think that's the nature of the game given that data analytics in this form is only uh, relatively new or has become more popularized in the last I want to say three to four years more mainstream in the last let's say one to two seasons with, with a heavier uptake but that is only one side of the coin so what I'm sharing here when I'm referring to data analytics, but more so predictive analytics in this. So, so there is a, a difference here because predictive analytics is in, in a way predicting an outcome. But there, there's so much more to that because what we're looking at here are the technical inferences. Um, so by that, if you're a top 100 player, you're expecting expected to perform a certain way that aligns with that ranking. If you are a top 50 player, you are expected to perform a certain way that aligns with that ranking. Now, I need to underscore that this is backed by more than 150,000 inferences. And I'm, I'm sure if you've been following us for some time now, you're really familiar with this and, and, and it feels like a broken record. But I'm just sharing it if you are new and if you have not heard this before. So where I'm going with this is that we've gotten to the point where we know the technical metrics of a player at a given level, uh, whether it's top uh, 300, top 100, top 80, top 50, top 30, top 20, top 10, etc. That's how uh, profound and exciting this uh, work is. And the best part is, um, and this is why, it's so historical landmark findings world first all of those exciting buzzwords um, because these technical analytics that are compounded by and supported by and backed by the data so underscores what happens next if you perform a certain set of technical metrics there are direct correlations with a ranking range. Now, this is how um, profound the work is and why data analytics that have the capacity to pinpoint a technical metric or performance uh, are directly not only correlated with that ranking, but can predict if that player is going to ascend to the next ranking range or not, which is very profound. So we use data in a different way. 
If you want to develop a top 10 tennis ranking, this is what you need to do from a technical perspective to get to that level of play. Now, the best part here is that we've also got direct correlations with a Grand Slam success. That's not just technically based. There's a lot more to it, but the the, the techni- technical side of it forms the backbone. If you if you like, if you like, um, so that is just one stepping stone, and there are all these other moving parts from winning a first Grand Slam, um, winning multiple Grand Slams. Why uh, Djokovic, for example, has been able to maintain his hold not only inside the top ten, but he's been able to achieve uh, replicated success over and over again, and so that is multiple Grand Slams. And so some may be surprised by this, but that's not the case. Now. There's a very big argument that, well, you know, Djokovic is too good and all these players, they're just not good enough to to toe the line. But what actually is uh, uh, misconstrued is that Djokovic has these technical metrics that these other players are not meeting. Or they may have them, but they're not as consistent or frequent enough. Now, when we switch over to the WTA tour, then you've got the likes of a Swiatek to Sabalenka to Ribikina, um, who are all are coming up to Gorf and others winning whether one, two, three, four Grand Slams or those who have won their first, or even Jabir, who's been runner-up now on uh, multiple occasions. Now, there is a direct correlation with these metrics as well, and the level of application, the rate of application, the patterns of play. So you would have heard me uh, touch on these uh, key terms previously, and I've written about them uh, this week specifically, just between these matchups on these players. Um, And and they're really just um, matches that I thought could be quite interesting to share. By no means are they necessarily the biggest and grandest matches of the day. Um, They've really been very randomly picked in a manner of speaking. And as the week, uh, the second week unfolds, obviously, uh, that sample's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, But to elaborate on that, the What Is Your Game Missing series really affords more. All right, I just wanted to start off with that and to share, I think, from the the technical side and how that works because data can be so incredibly powerful and sure, it can inform a player's decision and say, hey, this player really favours their backhand 68% of the time. You know, they go out to the juice court far out wide, you know, um, only 12% of the time, which uh, is a very silly metric, but you you see where I'm going. Or, you know, it allows a player to inform, I'm I'm going to go to this point during play because this is the player's weak, weaker shot. And that's just one side of the coin because that may be the case. However, if a player is using these specific metrics, which you would have heard of as the seven keys and now the eighth key. So the eighth key was unveiled in the new release, uh, how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking, the power of the eighth key. But all eight keys are are key metrics in a manner of speaking that need to be included in a player's conditioning, framework, schematic, etc. on that road towards that top 10 tennis ranking or that next Grand Slam title, that win. Um, So there's a very big differential here, whereas that type of data informs one side of the coin. But I can guarantee you that if a certain player is not using those metrics on a given day that's the result and that's how exciting it is because irrespective if you're going to just keep batting and batting and batting a player's backhand and and that's what the, those specific um, data analytics are saying that that is their weak point if that player already is not using these key metrics on that backhand to optimize that backhand 
of course that's the case. So it's, it's a different use case for metrics and then they're very differently informed. Uh, but I can tell you before those players step on the court what that outcome is going to be. Halfway through a match, for example, if one, per, if one player is using these metrics more so than the other, we know the outcome. Um, and I'm going to dive more into it, I think, with these matches because there are a couple that I've watched, especially um, over the last three days, um, that I, I think it's time to dive into. And so these are in no specific order. But we're going to start off with the end of the second round matches um, on the WTA Tour and go into the third round on the WTA Tour before then switching over to the ATP Tour and those results. All right, so to kick off uh, these matches, we've got Azarenka versus Torsen. Three sets. I'm really happy with how she's been tracking. Um, the three, of course, I would favor those two sets. But what this shows me is that Azarenka's, Azarenka's been fine finding a rhythm. Even though there's been some highs and lows, th th this is a good point. All right, Austin Penko versus Tom Lanovich. That first set was incredibly brutal. It was very, very quick, but well done to Tom Lanovich, then bringing her game for the second and third set. I think it goes without saying, Austin Penko, 11th seed, Tom Lanovich is just coming back. That's a relatively good performance, I'll say. Yastromenska, she is having a stellar tournament. Good for her and that was very clean against uh, Greg Chiva. Now I'm going to apologize in advance for my pronunciation of these names. By all means, please send through the correct pronunciation. I will do my best. Um, and I probably will apologize a few more times uh, throughout today's episode because there are some tongue twisters there. All right, the next match, which I think it has to go down as the match potentially of the Australian Open, Blinkova over Ribikina in three sets, second round. That tie break, oh my goodness, I hope each and every one of you watched it. Otherwise, please watch it again and replay. 22 to 20. That was a blockbuster. That was edge of your seat. Uh, it's one of the best matches I've seen in a long time. Uh, Blinkova, irrespective of her ranking, she was she was playing very solid tennis. I, I really liked where her metrics were tracking. Uh, Ribikina, did she play? at her level that she can play no she, she did not she did not she was not using the metrics that align with that top 10 tennis ranking however i think all credit to blinkova not allowing her to do so um Glubik, again, Siniakova in three sets. Very good performance. She's having a solid um, uh, Australian Open, uh, though we know, and I will get then to the next round. Svitolina Tomova in straight sets. I think everyone's heard me mention um, how good Svitolina was and how impressive she's been after she's been coming back. And it's been really exciting because with how now Svitolina's performing. Look, she's already the 19th seed. 12 months ago, she obviously was not seeded. Um, and she. this is re really solid. I'm going to pinpoint Svitolina now as a, a potential barrier breaker this season. And that'll be very um, cool and exciting in really good ways because we know she's been inside the top 10 for a number of years prior to stepping away to start a family. And now coming back, I think it just underscores and goes to show um, what's really possible and the full potential because Tennis is an incredibly elite, hard sport. And when it comes to women who have just had um, a, a child and then even a Asaka coming back six months after, I don't know any other sport where that happens so quickly, that turnover. Um, obviously, that's not what all uh, players choose to do for very good reason because, oh my goodness, but I just wanted to highlight how hard that is, um, so physically and mentally, emotionally, and then to have a player to be able to hold their own and to come back. Now, I think this is Svitolina's uh, almost second season um, back, um, but yeah, definitely she is projected to ascend closer towards that top 10 tennis ranking and I'm quite confident that once she does become a barrier breaker she's probably going to find that rhythm again like she once did. 
Navarro Solid Tournament against Cocchiaturetto. Um, I'm very sorry for that pronunciation. Three sets. Navarro's actually been playing um, quite good. Her um, metrics do align with her current ranking roughly I'm going to say so she's not quite on the cusp of a top 20 plus ranking though she has been playing quite steady I've been noticing Wang against Raducanu now this is a match and you would have heard me earlier saying uh, Wang's performance um, against Zhang but this was solid and I need to say despite Raducanu looking quite unwell in that third set and then finding her own again and it being okay so I, I hope she's okay is that Wang played very solid. There are a lot of ups and downs, and I think the the match that I touched on against Zeng, there were she was more consistent. But this match, it, it showed some really good key moments, and all credit as well to Raducanu because I think this is actually the best I've seen her play um, since that U.S. Open Championship. She has um, very good metrics. So if you're out there, Emma, this was very solid and I need to say some of those seven keys were evident all of them no that's not the case but that she needs to increase that rate of consistency to frequency of those key metrics and I really need to underscore that obviously Wang was more consistent and going through in three tight sets really needs to be applauded. Zeng against Bulta. That was a quite solid performance, I'm going to say, for Bulta against the number 12th seed. Um, I don't think she played bad. Zeng was just a little bit too good on the day. And so for Bulta to go 3-3 three and three against the 12th in the world was very solid. This one was a surprise packet. Bural over Pagula, 6-4, 6-2. Now, recall previous episode where I said Pagula did have the potential to go further, this Australian Open, and this is um, one of many shocks. Um, you've already heard me mention Ribikina not playing at that level. Pagula just not playing at that top 10 tennis uh, level. Bural played lovely and that's what I really need to underscore is that we've talked about players finishing on a high now we know uh, last season uh, Pagula WTA finals had a stellar performance so when we're looking at the start of a new season this is where we see seeds fall because one they haven't been able to maintain those peak performances from last season and we know roughly there's only I, I think off the top my head around six to eight weeks maximum between then and really it's the responsibility of their team by working in the peak performances those peak performance cycles transitioning um, but from memory as well you're going from US Open hardcore to a relatively similar surface at the Australian Open so it's really about managing the, the performances between them not overloading not overdoing it but doing enough and working on when that next peak performance is going to be which should be obviously the Australian Open and that's why you see some of the top 10 players performing exceptionally well this time of year and others they fall way too early and it really is um, a part of ascertaining and integrating those eight keys to make sure you don't fall by the wayside um, though it also is a slower start to a season to some because th those that start slower more often times also then will have a solid year ahead but that's also not always the case because you have players like uh, Djokovic who is typically able to maintain his level of play throughout a season. And you go, well, it's because it's Djokovic. And no, that's not the case. Sure, he's been able to fine tune his um, level of play over a number of years now, but it's because those eight keys are so solidified in his game. So for a player to be able to maintain those peak performances, 
it really comes down to knowing the eight keys and ensuring they're integrated in your game consistently. Of course, there are other aspects that can affect a player's um, performance. So whether that's emotional, mental, but this we really want to talk on the, so the physical, the performative side. So there's still a lot of work, I think, behind the scenes. But at the end of the day, we're talking about if a player is already top 100, what uh, state you are essentially already in towards top 50, etc., and what it takes behind the scenes to progress there as well. Now, if all of those, uh, let's say, moving pieces uh, have been addressed, this is what's separating that player from progressing from that top 20 ranking to, say, top 10 from that first round to that second round performance. Okay, at uh, Stevens versus Kazakina, this is a really good one, and that is why um, I really had to do a write up on this because uh, Stevens played really good, especially those last two sets, but I gotta give it to Kazakina. That first set was relatively clean. Was Kazakina playing, I think, an alignment with number 14 with her seeding? Probably not. It wasn't as consistent as, as I've seen her play. Uh, the same probably goes to Stevens, but of course, she was playing above her current ranking. I need to say she, she has been playing quite good, quite solid. Her consistency is not necessarily there, but still packs a punch. So I really want to encourage you to, to read that write up because it really, I think, um, fine tunes one why Stevens can still be so dangerous. Paolini against Maria. Uh, straight says Paolini is having the tournament of her career. That was a very solid win and she has caught my attention. Doden versus Trevisan, four and four. Uh, I'm gonna say this is a relatively good match for both of these players. Um, a reasonable level of consistency, but were there any elements there that really, I think, underscored, yes, the seven keys um, are present? Um, no. Now remember that the seven keys come first before the eighth key. Um, the eighth key amplifies that and is responsible for those Grand Slam titles to replicated success and um, becoming a barrier breaker. But the seven keys need to be solidified uh, as number one. So we really want to underscore that to allow that play to get to the eighth key. And this is where that next match comes in. Swiatek versus Collins. Now, I think it's um, potentially um, forgotten at times that Collins did reach the finals of the Australian Open. I think it was two seasons ago now. Now, oh my goodness, for Swiatek to have Kennan in the first round, Collins in the second round, that is absolutely brutal. This match could have gone either way. I was on the edge of my seat. I was very nervous for both players either way um, because 6-4, 3-6, 6-4, it was almost like it was a quarterfinal, semifinal result. Um, and the same applies to when... Um, Swiatek had to play Kennan and these were really tough first and second round matches that I really need to I think um, highlight. Um, of course there are players that this does happen to but you've got a, a former uh, Grand Slam champion in the first round and the Grand Slam finalist in the second round and it's the beginning of your season. So typically you're going to find your groove so the three sets is not as surprising and that it's taking because it is again that caliber of player I would expect a top 10 player against a lower ranked player that has not reached that that heights or those heights of success um, to do two cleaner sets However, and of course, if they're really bringing their A game. So this was a very brutal, but a very good match for Swiatek. But Collins really should be proud of herself because that it was very close. But I also need to highlight that did Swiatek play how I've seen her play and how we know she can play? Were her metrics all there? No, that was not the case. This was probably one of the weaker matches that I've seen her play um, with those hiccups um, in there. So there obviously um, were highs and lows. But credit to Collins for pushing that 
out of sphere tech but i probably also need to underscore that irrespective that first second round encounters from sphere tech that that the level of consistency was not there i'm going to say that something was not quite a hundred percent um irrespective that forehand the back end when she was obviously uh, making contact and swinging through just at the end you will notice of sphere tech's follow through she would hook that ball over and the ball would go slightly further out um, the depth was not a problem necessarily those key metrics were really good most of them were really good they were there but that one that underscores I think that trajectory, but also that point of contact, um, using the momentum as well, falling back slightly. So when we're getting a little bit more technical, when I was uh, reviewing that, um, being a bit more analytical in this um, respect, there was a reason why this result happened. Um, now it's going to be very interesting to see, I think, the follow-up from this, but I'm going to keep a close eye on that because, again, that the, the result at the end of the swing on both sides, and I'm going to refer to it just as hooking, um, pulling back rather than falling through. Um, the, the text, the seven keys to optimize your life, the what is your game missing series, the I'm your tennis coach and guru, the science of elite performance, all of those, what's that five texts there really underscore I think the technical side and the downside of what happens there when the kinetic chain, when there's a bit of a kink there. Um, and we've got a lot of our posts on that. So for the number one seed, number one player in the world, it's um, compounded even more so because when you're looking at those micro discrepancies is what I term them um, that can be a three set match or a clean sweep in, in, uh, from that perspective all right Neskova versus Kessler three sets very solid Kalaskina versus Rus this was an interesting match I thought that was going to be a little bit closer um, but now well that, that was that was a lot let's move on to the, the third round encounters Krachagova versus Hunter. This was a brutal one for all of the Australians listening out there because for Hunter, um, I think this is her best Grand Slam result. Uh, those who are not familiar with her, she, number one doubles player. She was crowned at the end of last season, which was incredibly exciting for her. But Krejcikova, we have to remember, she's the ninth seed. She's a top 10 tennis player. Um, so that was really exciting, I think, for Hunter to take Krejcikova to three and really needs to be applauded for that. But congratulations to Krejcikova to pushing through. Is Krejcikova playing, I think, her A game with this respect? No, uh, I'd love to see that shine through, but her metrics were definitely there. They definitely outweighed Hunters in this respect. Um, Tim of Fever over Haddad Maia. Um, straight sets, a very tight tie break, but Tim of Fever again has been playing very solid. I think the best tournament potentially of her life, of her career, which is very exciting. Um, so much so that she was not on my radar, but I tell you what, she is now. Because both of these players, Krejcikova, Timofeeva, fourth round, here we come. Which means if you're in the round of 16, you've got my attention. Now I'm going to have a more, uh, let's say, close look and be able to track your performance for the rest of the season. Uh, Fretch, same goes over um, Sakharova. Three sets. Fretch, again, has been playing very good. Let's see again. Round of 16 berth, very exciting on what's to come. Gorf over Parks. Now, this was one of the write-ups. I thought Parks was going to um, bring a higher level of performance. There's been some relatively good noise around her, but I tell you what, all credit to Gorf. That was clean, that was brutal, love and two. Is she playing the type of tennis that allowed her to claim the US Open? 
you bet. And I tell you what, I don't think we've seen a player uh, scoop the US Open and the Australian Open since Naomi Osaka did that back to back twice. Um, I think that's a few years ago now. I want to say maybe that was three and four seasons back roughly off the top of my head. Gorf definitely has the potential. So I'm really looking forward to see how she plays uh, round of 16 onwards. Has she been pushed to date? No, she has not been pushed. She's been able to play her game. I want to see what happens when Gorf is pushed because that's going to be a very good indicator for that semi-final to finals to that second championship. But I tell you what, depending on what happens over the next couple of days, Gorf is primed to achieve replicated success. Now, there's a little secret here. And again, it's underscored in the What Is Your Game Missing series. Uh, more uh, succinctly, What Is Your Game Missing to win? And that is obviously that underscores replicated success and time frames of, believe it or not, if a player will win their second Grand Slam title or not. Which means players such as Kennan, we're able to track if she was going to win a second Grand Slam or not. Andres Scoot, if she was going to win a second Grand Slam or not. Now, now, never say never, but this is a more specifically in a given time frame. So I'm really looking at Gorf's performance um, as well as others, uh, but more so because she is that defending US Open champion. And if that peak performance is able to carry her through. And so this is what I think I'm touching on when we're looking at players who have been dropping early from the likes of Ribagina, Pagula, Jabur, and a handful of others that I've, I am missing, not intentionally, um, but because golf has been able to maintain this level of performance, uh, Swiatek again. So something's not quite right in those other players, those other top 10 tennis players, um, but golf has been able to maintain it. And this is where the, uh, that eighth key comes into play play and if there's a, again a kink in the chain it needs to be addressed to just tighten that player's game so it's not a case of say Djokovic being able to maintain that level throughout a season we're looking also at Gorf as an example being able to maintain that level throughout a season so that's what differentiates the best players in the world from the other best players in the world so that 8% to that 2% that's underscored again in the what is your game um missing to win series but more so the latest release um how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking um, that underscores what 92 percent of players do not know what eight percent of players know and why two percent of top 10 players will regress every season and so those who obviously lose um, early on so prior to the round of 16 if they're not able to find their groove find that rhythm they do become more susceptible um cost Again, uh, then Essian. I hope I tried to pronounce that three sets solid. Um, Kostyuk, uh, making that round of 16 birth is very exciting for her. So again, I'm looking forward to see what in, what's to come. Um, Andreeva against Parry. Oh my goodness, this was tight. Look, 1-6, 6-1. So I think neither player played or one player played their best one set, the next, the next set. Then both of them actually played their game in the third uh, set. If you were following, you would have noticed Parry was up um, in the third. I think roughly from memory, it, it was 5-1. And then something clicked on Driva was able to claw her way back. And oh my goodness, was that impressive. But I want to really make sure Parry gets the credit there for playing really good. Um, and that on Driva just found that next level. Um, and this is really exciting because last year, she was the Australian Open junior champion and a couple of our previous episodes have touched on and our blog post about that transition between junior to senior and Andreeva has to be one of the first players in a while that's being able to make a very solid transition at the beginning I think of her initial um season on the senior tour I'll say um, so making the round of 16 is incredibly impressive 
Uh, irrespective of what happens uh, now in the round of 16, we really want to track that performance because, again, um, she's still in that initial 10 years of play um, or on the cusp of that second uh, decade of play. So we want to make sure that's managed quite uh, carefully to ensure Andre is able to peak in the years to come, irrespective if she wins a Grand Slam in the next couple of seasons. Um We won't know until we're able to track a little bit more closer, but I don't necessarily encourage players to win too early on because we want to maintain those peaks. Gore, for example, um, we tracked um, roughly four to five seasons ago and then she was ready um, for that US Open Championship because that is roughly when we predicted her performance peak, Um, which is, again, very exciting, but it's a it's a way of tracking to manage a peak opposed to overloading too soon um it's obviously a lot more involved but i'm trying to do it i guess um, in a nutshell sabalenka against serenko that was absolutely brutal Sabalenka just played too good. Um, Serenko, I've seen her played really solid before. And we really need to remember, she's the 28th seed. And so she is a solid player in her own. So all credit to Sabalenka. Um, She is in prime form to defend her title, which is quite exciting. Um, Anna Samova against Badosa. Oh my goodness, it's very good to see Anna Samova back. Um, From memory, I know she had a very successful season. I think it was at the French Open. I do not have it in front of me, but she was tracking very good towards top 30, potentially top 20. And I did touch on this in our earlier episodes on days one um, through to four. Now, Anna Samova, though, coming up against Bedosa. Bedosa played a very good first and second round, so this was actually quite challenging. Bedosa played relatively good. Anna Samova, though, took it up and another level. So I'm looking forward to Anna Samova in the round of 16. Um, She is definitely, I think, more favoured to be a bit of a dark horse there. Though I'm pretty sure I know who she's facing in that round of 16 encounter and that's going to be very tough. That said, irrespective if she's playing a top 10 tennis player, a defending champion or not, If she's able to bring her uh, game that she has been, I think, working on and has progressed towards, she's got some very solid key metrics that are looking like they're aligning with the seven keys. And if she's able to maintain that, I think there are very good things to come this season that she's finally starting to find her own again. All right, I think that wraps up the WTA tour. Um, So uh, actually, before I get ahead of myself, we do have a few more rounds. And I did do that last episode because I got a little bit excited. These matches that were um, the wrap up of the third round encounters. Oh my goodness, there are a couple of favorites in there. Svitolina against Golubic. Golubic, she wasn't playing exceptional, but I tell you what, Svitolina, boy, I'm happy to have her back. And I know I've touched on this again in the second round, but this is very solid. And then this is where we get to Swiatek. Noskova played very good. Um, This is where Swiatek was hooking um, even more, was not playing her A game. This potentially Noskova, uh, if it was her first round encounter, I think it would have been very different. First or second round encounter, a very different outcome. But for Swiatek to play play Noskova off the back of Collins and then off the back of Kennan, it was very brutal. And I think uh, it wore her out, Um, not just physically but mentally her game was not quite there and I think we could really see that that something which was not right and I I think afterwards she mentioned something around pressure etc and we do have episodes on pressure to perform 
even at the elite level through to the de- um, or down back to the, the developmental level and that it really does play a role on the biggest stages in the world um, a bit uh, heartbroken for Swear Tech to go out like that because she wasn't playing her best but I, I you know what Niskova gee she played solid only 19 years of age but here's a little bit of a fun fact which um, I'm hoping all the fans here are listening to because um, correct me if I'm wrong but um, Kvitova when Petra Kvitova won her Wimbledon championship all those years ago um, the coach she had in her corner now I do not recall his name but I do remember that face uh, Noskova the very same coach now that is exciting for multiple reasons because the eighth key through to the seven keys and i've touched on why that coach athlete relationship is so fundamental Um, there's a very good chance that coach has access to those seven keys Um, we'll see uh, soon enough if that eighth key does come through but Noskova to have that coach in her corner and to achieve this result is what makes this outcome not as surprising not as shocking it tracks Noskova to potentially break into not only to the top 30, potentially the top 20 this season if she's able to achieve a level of maintenance that is maintained uh, with those uh, key progressions um, throughout the season. So definitely with this round of 16 birth, irrespective of what happens, what the outcome is, uh, that's a very exciting, I think, uh, prospect uh, for the uh, Nuskova to come this season. As a ranker against um, Austin Penko, that first set was absolutely brutal. I was really looking forward to this. I thought it was going to be a little bit more close, like that second set, 7-5. Um, Austin Penko played a different match against um, Tom Lan- Lanovich. was a lot more solid. Um, but I tell you what, as a ranker, she brought her game. And I tell you what, this, this is what makes me excited because I love to see Azarenka playing at this level of play. Uh, Paolini, let's wrap um, the women's side up against Blinkova. Very solid, especially after Blinkova's stellar second round performance. But this is really good for Paolini. 26 seed, we have to remember, so it's not too shocking. But this performance, her best Grand Slam performance, round of 16. So here we come and let's see... um, What's, what's, what's to happen? Doden begins at Burrell, two and four. Both of them, I don't think we're expected necessarily to reach this level, but Doden, round of 16 birth is, again, incredibly exciting. Um, and I'm now has made it onto my radar. I'm going to be looking at her game a lot more closely. Zeng and Wang, I've touched on previously, again, in the blog post, but why this was a stellar match. I mean, look, 10-8 in that tiebreaker. 6-4. 2-6 so underscore Wang took 2-6 off the number 12 in the world 7-6 um, I wish that match wrapped up a, let's say a little bit more nicely I'm going to say because Wang really did deserve a lot of credit there um, but Zhang well done round of 16 though I really need to underscore number 12 in the world um, making a round of 16 is definitely expected um, and I need to see more of that for Zhang to potentially to become a barrier breaker with this result she potentially is primed to become a barrier breaker however is more susceptible than to being a part of that two percent which means um progressing to a top 10 ranking but then regressing soon thereafter if that play is not able to maintain that um, so we've got a number of plays that's happened to um, one who's on the comeback is um, Bedosa is an example when she was inside the top 10 doing very solid but then more easily regressed because it was very quick that ascension inside the top 10 and those key metrics were not there however good news for Bedosa on a little bit of a tangent here is that when I've been reviewing her games those metrics actually are looking better than in previous years um, better than they were when she ascended towards I think her peak was at number two in the world although that did not align with any peak performances at the Grand Slam level I really need to underscore that Bedosa was not I think reaching a 
consistent peak performance uh, levels and of play at the Grand Slam level again so that's what's interesting to see if that's to come this season but we really need to look at the metrics um, of performance outcomes um, and round of 16 and or further so Zhang this is a very good start for her Stevens did fall in the third round against Callan Skay Callan Skay did play very good that that first set was very tight obviously going to Stevens but Callan Skay she, she just lifted her game the second and the third Yastromenska then against Navarro I was very solid in three so i am looking forward to what's to come i think in this new round and of course my new round is a round of 16 which really brings everything to a new level all right let's go back then to the men's side and we need to wrap up then the end of the second round encounters through to the third round all right medvedev five sets against rusavuri and I really hope I've tried to pronounce that correctly. But wow, this goes on to press that many uh, five setters, which we're going to get to um, what has happened in the second round is, oh my goodness. But Medvedev 6-0 in the final set really goes to show, I think, um, his level of play. But he was down uh, two sets to love and then scooping those last three very tight, 6-4, six, 7-6 seven, six, before the six love. That's actually quite impressive. But I think it goes without saying he wasn't able to find his rhythm to begin with. Hercax, another five sets. And it's all even though it was one set apiece, and it was back, forth, back, forth, 6-3 in the third, Menzik, he did put on a show. Obviously, that level of consistency is not there just yet. But again, we're talking about the second round encounters. Um, Olga Al 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 Alassimi, and I, I'm really hoping, it's a tongue twister for me, against Grenier, second round round four sets that was solid um felix i think is going to hopefully have a better year than last rune falling to kazooks now i tell you what kazooks even though he was not on my radar and this is a second round encounter he does have some very good metrics and it was not surprising that he toppled rune rune was not essentially playing bad his metrics were pretty good his rate of application to his level of consistency however on those key metrics was not so that that was down um, from what I would have expected though rune still solid so all credit to Kazooks this was very good now this player is one to watch um, Dimitrov Kokonakis four sets good for Kokonakis to grab a set there that was very solid Dimitrov though was he playing at the level that he played in Brisbane maybe not no, I'm very happy that he was able to progress. Humbert against Zhang. I'm quite impressed actually with Zhang. Um, but four sets, Humbert with the win. Um, Greek and Sport against Phelps. Four sets. Um, I think the third round from Greek and Sport says a lot more there. Um, but that's an um, interesting matchup. It, um, as far as metrics are concerned, uh, it was not tracked as closely. The same goes for Shang and Nagal. Well done for Nagal, Indian player, four sets. Although falling in the second round, Shang played, I want to say relatively good. I only caught snippets of this match. Um, Borges against um, Davidovich Fakina. Now, Davidovich Fakina, 23rd seed, he was tracked, I want to say, two to three seasons ago to progress. And look at him now, 23rd in the world and this is when he was i think roughly 90 to 80 in the world so i do love seeing that happen when our metrics align although again we know what separates 20 or top 20 towards top 10 so he does have a way to go but i tell you what to progress from 80 to 23 in the world but be a seated player is absolutely exceptional Borges, however, is having the tournament of his life. <laughs> Alcaraz over Sinegro. He was actually pushed, Alcaraz was. Although winning in three, he came up against two tie breaks. This is the closest match I think he's had that easily could have gone to five, um, but he was pushed. His next match, though, uh, his third round encounter says a lot more. Um, Krekmanovic against Struff. 
this was good. This was this was very solid because five sets, two of them in a tie break was an oh my goodness. But then again, his third round encounter says a lot more. But remember, Struff 24th seed. So it was actually a very solid performance. Paul over Draper in four sets. Again, was very close. We got a lot of close ones on the men's side. Rudd against Purcell, five sets. So all credit to the Aussie. Purcell, that really hope um, onwards and upwards because it's a heartbreaker to fall this close in the second round against the 11th seed. Um, Rudd, was he playing in a line alignment with the metrics we know he's capable of? No. However, he was able to play very solid and hold his own when it really counted. 10-7 in that tiebreaker. That was incredibly brutal. That has to be one of uh, my favorite uh, matches today, this Australian Open. It was absolutely exceptional from both players. Zarev versus Klein. This is another five setter. Believe it or not, 10-7 in the fifth. Klein played absolutely exceptional. Zarev, I'm going to say he played okay. Was he playing at that level of a top six player? Sometimes. Klein, however, was playing as a top 20 player. The level of some of these players pushing some of the best players in the world to five sets is very interesting, but incredibly commendable because this level of play really marks these players um, who have not had, let's say, the most optimal season. And those who are pushing these players have had potentially quite a good run up till now. At Nori versus uh, Zeppereri. <laughs> five sets there. Nori was down two sets. Uh, and I do love it when I see a player coming back from two sets down. But it was very tight. Again, these five sets in the caliber of play against these top players or at least players inside the top 20 is not often seen, um, not from recent memory. So it's actually very exciting to see them being pushed by, I'm going to say these newcomers in a manner of speaking. But then on the flip side, their A games, this Australian Open, are not quite there. Uh, fortunately, in a, in a way, the men have five sets to find their rhythm. The women, however, when we've seen those seeds drop, it's over three. So they don't have as much time um, it, it, to claw their way back in, a, in, in from that perspective. Um, although, obviously, they're, they're a different. I think of one women's match in three sets, I think it was yesterday, um, was still going when a men's match, I think it was four sets, was wrapping up. Um, four or five. Now, I don't remember whose um, was on, but they w they went on court at the same time and the men's match left prior to the women's. So that just goes to show, I think, how close they were as well. So very different, I think, from uh, that perspective. All right. The third rounds for the men's we're on to now. So that was just wrapping up at the ends of the second round. Rublev versus Quarter. I actually thought it was going to be pushed a bit further. Quarter has progressed to be 29th seed. He has been um, one of the players who has mustered up a bit of attention, I want to say, in the last two seasons. But Rublev, straight sets very solid. Rublev's going to fly under the radar. I'm looking very much to his round of 16 and what's to come. Um, Dimineur against Kaboli again. The Aussie is doing exceptional with newly crowned top 10 tennis player. If you've been listening to our episodes previously, you know how excited I am and have been about this because we track this again, similar to Golf a couple of seasons ago. And oh my goodness, do I love when our metrics align. The same with the likes of an Alcaraz, Swiatek, Osaka. And so it's not new. We've done it before. Rubikina, Sabalenka. Um, though I do um, abs absolutely love it when I think everything falls um, into place. 
And again, our predictive analytics, I think, can really show you um, what's really possible um, over the course of a number of seasons when you really do, I think, integrate them into your game. Uh, Djokovic against Echeverry, um, were quite solid, even though that set, uh, the third set went to a tiebreaker, I think it was relatively smooth sailing for Djokovic. Although Echeverry did push him, I think, when I think it really mattered but Djokovic he just amped up his level he, he's in his very good form Manorino against Shelton this was a really good one obviously Shelton went in their favorite but I think we really need to remember Manorino is the 20th seed Shelton's 16th seed Manorino has been around for some time now Shelton I think this is only his second season the beginning of his second season on tour and I think it's very easy to forget given his, um, I think, stellar first season. Uh, so really solid from Manorino. I'm not shocked here um, because of the very close in the ranking range. Um, but he does have a tough one up next. Though I can't recall the last time Manorino did make the, the round of 16 or if he has done that previously. So this is a very good performance for him especially given that he's in the later part of his career. So it's very exciting for Manorino. Tissipas against Van Ash. This was good. Actually, the more clean performance, cleaner performance that I've seen from Tissipas, um, especially that second set, six love. It was very clean. Van Ash did come back in the third, but it was a little bit too late. Fritz against um, Marosan. After Fritz's, I think, first round matches, this was very good to see. It was a bit more clean, which, which I liked. But I, again, I'm really looking forward to his round of 16 encounter. Sinner against Bayes. Sinner has been almost flawless. He is absolutely deserving of that fourth seeding and definitely is flying under the radar, playing incredibly clean. I'm going to put it out there. Sinner is playing the cleanest of any player on the men's side, and I don't think he's really been pushed yet. I'm looking forward to him being pushed and seeing how um, his game uh, levels up because I really think he has that capacity. Um, I'm not going to say of what, but I'm just going to underscore that when um, Alcaraz was tracked to ascend, so was Sinner. Good things happen for Alcaraz and good things are definitely in store for Sinner, especially at his current rate. Uh, Kakinikov against Makak. Four sets. Now, Kakinikov, I think, goes or uh, flies under the radar quite often because this is not his first round of 16 berth. Um, though, let's, let's see how far he can push it. Was he playing as solidly as some of the other players I've touched on? No, but he still has those weapons to just hang in there. And I think that's the most frustrating part when you're playing against him because obviously he does know how to pack a punch. Macaque uh, did play actually quite solid. It definitely could have gone either way. I mean, there are two tie breaks in there. Another very close match. So I'm going to be interested interested to see what type of level he brings in the round of 16. Now to wrap up these third round encounters, we've got some good ones. Zarev against Mickelson. I think this is the one where Zarev actually started to shine through a, a bit more. So and that's in three. Although there was a tie break in there. Mickelson's been having very good. I think this is his uh, first full year on tour or he came on tour last season similar to Shelton so it's going to be very interesting to see how his season tracks uh, Medvedev though against um, Felix um, Augur Alisame that was very solid that was very clean in three I'm going to say Felix actually showed signs of his capacity to ascend again towards a top 10 tennis ranking however He's not quite there yet. Medvedev is too solid, too clean. And again, I think Medvedev's flying under the radar. He's not getting the attention. Um, I think we know who is. But again, very clean. And all credit to him because after that match finished so late, his second round encounter, and then needing to back it up, um, 
good on Medvedev because he definitely was not running on a full tank. Uh, Borges did come out on top against Dimitrov. I did not see this. Now, I say that because Dimitrov was playing well. He played well in Brisbane. He was finding that new peak again. He's the 13th seed. Borges, though, four sets, two tie breaks, eight, six in that fourth set tie break. That was incredibly close. Borges, good on him. Best performance, I believe, of his career. Well done for Portugal, Uh, Portuguese tennis. So round of 16 is incredibly rewarding for him. Uh, and let's see what's to come. But he's definitely now on the radar. Nori against Rudd. Um, I was expecting this to go to five or for Rudd to lift his game. But it went the other way. Four sets. Nori, 19th seed against the 11th seed. That was solid. I think Nori played um, some of the best tennis I've seen him play in the past season, which potentially uh, puts him um, in a prime position to track closer towards the top 10. I'm not going to say a barrier break in this season until I think I see more of those results or more of those matches. So let's see what happened in the round of 16. Alcaraz against Shang. Uh, After his second round match, look, a 6-1, 6-1 was a bit brutal uh, with Shang uh, needing to retire in that third set. Alcaraz played incredibly clean. Kazooks against Greek and Sport. This is what I'm talking about. Third round here, 6-3, 6-3, 6-1. Kazooks played so cleanly. Um, he backed up that second round result, which was a little bit of a surprise. This against against the 28th seed, Greek and Spore. I tell you what, round of 16, I'm looking forward to this because Kazooks, irrespective if he was going to make the round of 16 or not, he's on my radar because those metrics, oh, I love it when I see a player who was not seeded, who was not expected to achieve results, and then all of a sudden I see them play and I see those key metrics. He is one um, to progress. And if Kazooks keeps this level of play up, in the next two to three seasons, he will ascend towards a top 20 ranking. Uh, But let's see his level of maintenance, his uh, rate of application, uh, obviously his level of consistency through those key performances. But I think the round of 16 result is where you start. And some players or one uh, player from memory, that is one of my favorites that started from that round of 16 and onwards is Jons Jabur when she made that uh, maiden round of 16 result. And boy, oh boy, did she track, obviously, towards that top 10 tennis ranking within, I think it was two seasons. Alcaraz is another one. Bedosa actually happened to be one of them around that time as well. Uh, So this was actually quite exciting to see, irrespective of that ranking. I think at the moment is just sitting outside the top 100. Herkax over Humbert. I wasn't too sure what was going to happen here because Herkax has not been playing, I think, exceptional in his first and second round. But against the 21st seed, he did end up coming out on top in four. So let's see what the round of 16 has. And look, to wrap up this third round result, we have um, Kekamanovic against Paul. Paul was the favourite. We've got five sets here. Um, I think Paul obviously was expected to walk away in three, but this is what I was talking about with uh, Kekmanovic's uh, second round and his first to see what's to come because he hung in there for five sets again, even though that fourth set, believe it or not, was 9-7. And he walked away the fifth set, six love. I don't think anyone saw that coming, but oh my goodness. And today's roundup was absolutely huge. Um, Over the course of these few matches, well, there's more than a few, wrapping up the last of the second round matches and all of those third round matches to set us up for today's matches, round of 16 and onwards, my favorite time of the Grand Slam, of the Australian Open, or irrespective which one, but I am bias being again in Australia the Australian Open is obviously the number one there but this is the recap of days five six and seven so that is the Thursday Friday and Saturday of the Australian Open 
And look, um, I don't think there's anything more exciting than looking at the future of these players and who are and or who is tracking towards not simply a quarterfinal to the semifinals to finals, who's going to obviously um, progress in that second week of the Grand Slam, but who is tracking and progressing towards and who was not already there that top 10 tennis ranking. Thank you so much for joining us today. Look, I really did wrap that up rather quickly because I was looking at the time and going, oh my goodness, yes, I did get a little bit exciting on a, on a couple of those players, to be fair. But thank you so much for listening. Uh, look, to grab a copy of The Secrets to Optimal Coaching Success that was touched on in the introduction and has been forming, I think, the baseline up until, up until these uh, special editions for the Australian Open. It's really profound just to set those markers to track towards a top 10 tennis ranking to build those fundamentals. But if you are participating in the Australian Open, if you're, well, I'd normally say a top 100 player, but we've got a couple of players here. Now in the round of 16, um, look, how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking is for you to progress. If you are a top 20 player, or top 10 player, grab your hands on um, this text because you're either going to be a part of the 8% who maintains their ranking inside the top 10 this season, or the 2% who are going to regress, who are not going to be ranked inside the top 10 come the end of the season. And there's going to be 2% who are going to cross that threshold and this is really exciting because with the round of 16 we're able to track the potential and or the likelihood of who that two percent roughly is going to be so to grab a copy of my new release how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking head on over to AMA international or on amazon so irrespective where you're based in the world for any comments or questions, head on over to AMA International or Topic Thread, the social platform set on data privacy. And to interact with Beyond Top 10 Tennis, head on over to Twitter, Threads or Instagram. To catch up on our weekly coaching tips, head on over to TikTok. And to catch up again on our blogs, head on over to AMA International um, and look for our blog tab or head on over to Medium. And as always, I'll leave all the links in the episode notes. And for something a little bit different, head on over to Pink Octopus Books. That's where my fictional release is. Uh, to view this week's question and poll, be sure to visit Spotify. Or for something left of field, visit Spruit for some random polls. And of course, if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, like, share, and all of the above would be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we do have scholarships available on AMA International as well as options to work with me exclusively to optimize your performance and to nudge you closer towards that top 10 tennis ranking so don't be shy and come and say hi on that note thank you so much for listening i am so incredibly grateful i am your host dr ashley morgan burge and this is beyond top 10 tennis and i'll see you next time mm-hmm.